Thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Tom and the Asia Society for hosting me this morning and all of you who've taken time out of your morning to be here. And to my good friend, Charles Rockefeller, um, whom I've known for so many years now, thank you for, as a board member, your commitment to the Asia Society and also to the Rockefeller, Rockefeller family for your decades and generations of philanthropy and for building up this society into really what is a preeminent a voice and repository for uh, leadership and thought leadership, uh, bringing, forging alliances in Asia for the United States, and really crafting a way forward for the United States and our Asian allies, and for us to think through thorny discussions, thorny issues. So thank you, Charles, very much for that. And um, I'm going to give just brief remarks, and then, of course, I'll take questions from Tom and from everybody here. Um, you know, as we think about as we think about the United States relationship with China and the ascendance of China on the world stage, China's economy, of course, is the second largest in the world right now. Expected, if everything continues the same way, to pass surpass the United States in 2030. Um, before we talk about that relationship, what it means for the United States, and how the United States should approach China, I think we should take for a second stock of where we are in the world and the challenges that the United States faces, but also that the nations of the world face very quickly. The first is that we're in a time of humanitarian crises. Right now, there are about 70 million people around the world who are displaced from their homes. Europe is still facing its largest migration since World War II, in part because of the war in Syria, but also in other places like Libya. It's not just Europe, but also in countries like Venezuela, in South America. There are over a million Venezuelans who have left that country over the last year, over the last two years, many of them to Colombia, but also to other places. Uh, the Rohingya, now over a million Rohingya, uh, in what has been the latest flare-up uh, of that very very tough issue, um, have left uh, Burma, many of those from Bangladesh. So we are facing in the world a great humanitarian crisis at this moment. We're also facing a lot of economic upheaval. The United States is basically in a trade war right now with China and has tense relationships with some of our allies, including the European Union. Although, on a positive note, it looks like the United States, uh, the Trump administration, may have reached an agreement with Canada and Mexico for a renewed NAFTA, which is something in Texas, because Texas does the most trade of any state in the nation. It's something that we've been watching and, and quite honestly, hoping for a renewed agreement that would work for all parties. So, But Europe is is still dealing and reeling from Brexit and how to handle that and move forward properly. Um, and so we're in a time of economic upheaval, as I mentioned, uh, where trade agreements are being questioned, uh, not just NAFTA, but the Korea agreement for the United States, uh, again, with, with Brexit, uh, China becoming more aggressive with its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so the third part of this is that in addition to the fact that we're in a time of a humanitarian crisis and also an economic upheaval, we're also in a time of security challenges, greater security challenges. If you think about it, terrorism continues to be franchised in not only in, in North Africa and the Middle East, but increasingly in other parts of the world. Uh, franchises of Al Qaeda and ISIS affiliates continue to try to grow in different nations, and that presents real challenges for us. Uh, there are also renewed tensions. Um, among nation states, you know, right after 9-11, so much of our focus has been on terrorism, not by nations, but obviously by groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, you get the sense now that these tensions among nations are flaring up uh, in a way and have come into focus in a way that they hadn't really, I think, for the last 15, 16, 17 years. So with that in mind, we come to the issue now of the United States and China, and specifically in China, a nation that is taking political, economic, and military um, opportunities to rise, to come up in the world. Um, and let me say, before I go into some of the, I guess, critiques and challenges, I want to mention some of the opportunities for the United States and China to work together, because the relationship doesn't have to be one. We don't have to fight just to fight. There are opportunities for us to, to 
cooperate and collaborate together. Uh, so, for example, on the issue of the Iran agreement, because China has a permanent seat on the UN Security Council, uh, China was very ho- one of the nations that was helpful in a- achieving that. Of course, the United States has now backed away from the Iran deal. But China has also come along in terms of its work with denuclearizing, helping to denuclearize North Korea. So on this nuclearization issue, China has actually been very helpful and working with the United States in ways that we hadn't seen before. That's a promising thing. Uh, China has also tried to emerge as a leader on climate change and making sure that we have a planet uh, where, you know, global warming is under control. Uh, China has become a leader in renewable energy. That presents an opportunity to work with the United States as well. Uh, and of course, economically, uh, China is our largest trading partner for the United States. And there are opportunities to continue to grow that. It, uh, I mentioned earlier, and as we all know, we're basically in a trade and tariff war. But if you look, for example, at American services purchased in China, that curve has gone pretty steeply up over the last several, well, let's say over the last decade. So there are some very promising things in the relationship. That said, as we know, there are also some very deep challenges. So I mentioned in three areas that I see, and I sit on the Intelligence Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee, where China has become very aggressive in charting its own path. The first one is politically. China has consolidated power around a singular leader in Xi Jinping, and the the China Communist Party has essentially what could be for life, entrusted the power of the country to one leader. Now, for, for Americans, that's something that's antithetical to us because you know, we're, we expect succession of a president every four or eight years of leadership. But for China, uh, for them, it's an opportunity to have what they believe is a charismatic face for the country, continuity and stability in the region and around the world. Also a leader that has gone into the world, as he did at the World Economic Forum last year, and painted China as a new leader on big issues like climate change. In other words, taking over the mantle of world leadership, some might argue on some issues, away from the United States. Um, So in terms of its internal politics, China, I would see this as buckling down, settling on one leader creating for them what they believe is a kind of stability and also a renewed efficiency. Uh, You know, democracy, democracy is a beautiful thing, right? But for China, the ability to make decisions very quickly where somebody is empowered to say, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And then to move capital also quickly to make it happen. For them, they see it as an advantage. So politically, they've done these things. Uh, Economically, China has also become uh, more aggressive. They have laid out a Belt and Road Initiative that it would include billions of dollars in investments in the region. Uh, They've also tried to entice countries to partner with them. So uh, if you look at um, what they did in Sri Lanka, for example, using leveraged debt, to try to go and entice countries to partner with them on different projects. they floated alternatives to American trade agreements, where, whereas ours was going to be the TPP. Now, of course, you have TPP-11. They floated RCEP in the region. So laying out an alternative course on trade agreements. Uh, so economically, they've also, you know, essentially are rising. And then the third part is militarily. Uh, I mentioned Belt and Road, and I put it, I, I struggled a little bit with which category to throw it into, you know, but I put it under economy, but it's also a security, um, it's also a, a security initiative. Uh, China, for the last several years, has gotten much more aggressive in the South China Sea, not just the South China Sea in terms of military, militarizing islands, but also uh, in the East China Sea, having flare ups with its neighbor Japan over the Senkaku Islands for example. Uh, So militarily, China is also uh, getting aggressive and investing heavily in its military. Uh, Their military spend continues to grow. A few years ago, China opened its first military base outside of mainland China in Djibouti. And as far as, you know, as far as we can tell, continues to look for future partnerships with other countries. Uh, So we can see a clear pattern here of not just fate, so to speak, of a huge economy overtaking that of the United States, but a comprehensive plan of action for China in each of these categories 
to emerge as a leader, a definitive and clear leader on the world stage. And I think if Xi Jinping has his way and China has its way as the dominant leader uh, decades from now on the world stage. And so this is the last part of my comment, and then I'll open it. We can open it up for discussion, for questions. What's lacking so far, as far as I can tell, from the United States, from our nation, is a comprehensive plan on a comprehensive approach on China. Yes, we're in, we're in a trade war. We're fighting over tariffs. But what is the end goal for all of that? What is it that we're trying to accomplish with these things? And yes, you know, we want better economic terms. We'd like them to drop some tariffs. But what is the overarching, what is our overarching frame from which we are operating? I have not seen a clear answer from the Trump administration on that. In fact, on any given issue with respect to really not just China, but almost any controversial foreign policy issue, you get two or three or four different answers from the administration, depending on who's talking. Sometimes conflicting answers from the president himself. Uh, so I can't tell you right now what they're, I can't distill for you the president's approach to China. Perhaps it would be be tough. Uh, for me, I think our approach should be to allow China to compete, but not cheat in the world. To compete, but not cheat. And think about how we achieve that. So, and we can talk about these things. Thank you so much, Congressman. Um, that's a great sweep you've given us in a short time of uh, not just the U.S.-China relationship, but a lot of parts of the world that we care about. I, I should note also, if you can't see this, that uh, the congressman gave that sweep without the benefit of much of the way uh, of notes here. Yeah. Uh, I've got more notes, I'm embarrassed to say, for my few questions than he has for what he just did. So thank you. Maybe I can just uh, – I, I want to pin you down on one uh, yeah. piece, which I think you just mentioned in passing, and that's the South China Sea. Um, and I don't know where this fits in an overarching – uh, compete, don't cheat strategy. But given the, um, it's a pretty specific question about what happened last week. Uh, the U.S. sailed, I think it's the USS Decatur, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the point that the, the U.S. military and the U.S. government makes, um, not just the Trump administration, but administrations before that, freedom of navigation, right. particularly given what the Chinese are doing on those islands. Uh, it's, it's, it's an expression of principle and all the rest, and it has to be done. Um, and then we had this uh, very rough in encounter uh, on the waters with the Chinese, potentially very dangerous. Specifically at this moment, when in the overarching relationship, it's really, really dicey right now. And I wonder whether uh, you think, principles notwithstanding, was it a good idea, as we are ratcheting up with almost every 24-hour period, uh, the tensions on the trade and economic and other sides, was it a good idea to exercise that point of principle uh, at this moment? Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, look, I think the United States approach should be, again, we don't want a needless conflict with China. We want as much cooperation as possible. And if this is an issue that had just flared up recently, I might say that Perhaps we could be we could approach it in a different way or be more prudent in the moment, as you described. But the buildup of um, these features in the South China Sea has been going on for quite a while now. And the development, their development by China has been going on now for several years. And so it is important that the United States establish um, that those waters that the United States will sail in international waters, uh, that we're going to traverse international waters and make sure that there is freedom of navigation, not just for us, but also for the nations of the world and our allies. I think that's incredibly important. I also think that uh, countries like uh, Vietnam and the Philippines and other Southeast Asian nations are looking to the United States to make sure that we remain committed, committed to the freedom of navigation there. Um, and so you're right. It, it does come at a very tricky time for us and a very tense time in the relationship. Um, but we've also this is also something that whereas the tariffs, this this trade war that we've gotten into is fairly new. Uh, this issue is a much more longstanding issue compared to that one. Thank you. And back to the, the broader relationship and your phrase compete, don't cheat. And far be it from me to imagine what a Trump administration official might say on this point, but I suspect <laughs> the, the 
architects, if you will, right up to the president himself of the, the current approach to China might agree with you that compete, don't cheat, is why we have approached uh, aggressively the way – I'm going to stop saying we uh, – <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, that might – that phrase uh, might be a, a bellwether for the approach they've taken. Yeah. So what's – do you agree with that approach? What's been right or wrong in your view about the way they have approached strictly this trade and tariff issue? Uh, you, you're right. They could possibly make the claim that, hey, you know, that's exactly what we're doing. We're, make, we're taking action to make sure that China doesn't cheat. But the fundamental problem with that is they've not, they have not laid out a clear goal, and their strategy has been quite erratic. And it's not just it's not just affected China, but also affected some of our allies like South Korea and Japan. So it's it's the equivalent of a scattershot approach. Um, and I don't think they've laid out also exactly what they mean by by cheating, uh, unless they're they're kind of operating under the assumption that all of us kind of get it. Um, so. So, yeah, I think that they're, they're missing any kind of explanation about their fundamental goals uh, or about the behavior that they're trying to change. Um, you know, when I'm thinking some of the issues, when I think about making sure that China is not cheating, we want to make sure that there aren't any illegal technology transfers uh, or technology transfers where national security information is compromised with China. Uh, we want to make sure that when when the nations of the world enter into trade agreements, that there isn't a wink and a nod that there's going to be child labor or some kind of human rights violations that are allowed with the nations in which we're partnering. Uh, and that's why the competition between something like TPP and RCEP in the region becomes very important. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there's behaviors that we want to make sure that we change. Some of the issues, obviously, with, um, with how uh, state-owned enterprises are funded and the capital that is directed to them, uh, I think those issues also need to be addressed. So I guess what I'm saying is that I'd, I'd like to see the administration lay out clearly the behavior that they're wanting China to change. And we've seen in the last few days also China not fully understanding or at least professing not to understand what is it, President Trump, that you want to see China change? Uh, what, you know, what exactly are you asking for? The other side at some point, and it's been a while now, needs to know what you're demanding of them. And that has not been laid out. Okay, I'll ask one more that is, is away from China and then over yeah. to the room. Uh, you opened, Congressman, with an assessment of some of the other really broad challenges and crises facing the planet, really. Right. And I took, but tell me if I was incorrect, implicit in that, that uh, some suggestion of an abdication of, of American leadership in some of these areas. And maybe if I can yeah. pinpoint, you you began with the, the really stark uh, facts and figures and stories about uh, humanitarian issues uh, from this hemisphere all the way to the Rohingya and everything else. Um, what, what's your assessment of uh, what, what the United States is doing now? But I guess more important, what, what do you think uh, America's role in these crises or in, in humanitarian endeavors generally ought to be? I think that we ought to be leaders among the nations of the world, a leader among the nations of the world. Uh, I understand that the United States can't fight or shouldn't fight every battle, but there are humanitarian crises that call to us where we should act where we can and act prudently. My sense right now, I was at the United Nations in, uh, I think, February earlier this year, and I made this remark to somebody there. I feel as though the, author the authoritarian leaders in the world right now, whether you're talking about folks like Erdogan in Turkey or uh, in the Philippines with Duterte and other places, feel as though nobody is minding the shop, as though they can do to their populations as they will. That is my concern, that if they feel as though the president of the United States and this administration is not fully committed to enforcing human rights, that you will see uh, more grievous action from repressive leaders uh, than we've even seen now. And so far, I, I was encouraged that you know, the United States on, on the Rohingya issue, for example, had already committed millions of dollars in the last few weeks, I think we've committed over $100 million more. I think that's a positive step. But um, 
the leaders of the world who would repress their people need to know that there is going to be a firm hand in the United States who is, and not just the United States, but also other allies who should also be helpful, including regional allies. I've pressed ASEAN, for example, the nations of ASEAN, to speak up more on the Rohingya issue, uh, because I don't think that responsibility for that should be left to people in the United States or Europe or Japan, who's been very helpful on that issue, uh, that, that the regional countries there should also take an active and, and full role. Uh, so I think we've got to, we should remain leaders. So quick follow-up. Do you yeah. think on, either on the committees on which you serve, particularly foreign affairs, or in the Congress writ large, do you think uh, your fellow uh, representatives share that view of a more robust American role in all these areas? On humanitarian issues, I believe so. I mean, look, there is a lot of, I don't want to call it quibbling because that's a too light a word. There is some intense debate about, upon what that means. What does it mean for us to be involved, right? Does that mean that you're going to go to war with countries? That you're going to launch some kind of ground offensive? Does it mean you're going to send money? I mean, these are the tough issues that as policymakers and for the president and the administration, they have to answer. Um, but yeah, I've seen actually very strong support among Republicans and Democrats uh, in the Congress on these issues. And that's been very encouraging at a time when, uh, particularly on domestic policy, but uh, even on some issues of foreign affairs, the Congress has been fairly split up. That sounds like understatement. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to the room. Uh, I can keep going, but I would rather not. We'll start with the gentleman with the hat. If you can just say who you are and keep it uh, yeah. as brief as possible. Uh, excuse me. My name is uh, Kevin Shanley. I'm on the Policy Institute. And just recently in Foreign Affairs, there was an article by a gentleman by the name of Stephen Bader, who I think is was in the Obama administration. And my point is this. The article is entitled, Stop Obsessing Over China. <laughs> and you know what he points out? And he points out that when you look at China today and its competition with the United States, it has many of the same earmarks as America and its competition with the Soviet Union. And it created a situation where um, is China getting overextended in the world? A. Is their debt becoming unmanageable? B. C, are they loaning money and making deals with countries financially who have a very poor, almost abysmal credit rating in terms of ever paying the money back to them? And in terms of a military competition with the United States, people think they're in. Can they really uh, win that without bankrupting their country in the process? So I guess the point of the article was maybe we should take a deep breath and take a cold shower <laughs> about China. And is is, and I had yeah. a lunch yesterday with a foreign correspondent from China to the United Nations through Wuhan Daily, and he we talked about Xi Jinping, and he says he said to me, well you know, the Chinese leaders are very insecure about their position in, in power in China as well they should be. If the economy ever goes down the tank, which is part of their legitimacy, how quickly will that translate into um, strong opposition? I'll stop right there. So are we obsessing too much about China? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, that's why I opened early on by saying, look, you don't want to get in a fight just to get in a fight. Uh, don't want to be histor hysterical for no reason. Uh, but, you know, for example, when you see the news that broke in the last few days about uh, in terms of cyber issues, in this case, the, the implantation of chips on hardware that could possibly monitor either what the United States government or major U.S. corporations are doing, that's a legitimate concern. I mean, that, that's a real concern for us. And we've got to take action to prevent that. Um, you're right. I mean, the United States military is still the strongest in the world. The United States economy is still the strongest in the world, uh, but China is doing everything possible to come up. And you mentioned the internal dynamics of China. Uh, what's unsettling to me is that Chinese society is becoming um, much more controlled. Uh, you know, they don't have the same privacy rights, for example, that folks in the United States have, and. When you mentioned the ability of the people to rise up, 
uh, I'm concerned with the way the society has developed that that's becoming more and more difficult for people to express um, to express their opinions, uh, to express their disagreements with the government, and to not be penalized for that. Um, that to me is a very a very disconcerting development internally in China. Uh, a little further down, and then we'll come to Dan. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned TPP, but there's a lot of agreements that the United States has, has pulled away from. And I guess my question, it's a relatively brief one, is how permanent is the damage? If the administration should change in a couple of years, are we kind of, how, let's put it this way, how easy do you think it would be to reestablish our position in the world and in these agreements, like the Paris Accord, the Iran nuclear deal, TPP, et cetera? Uh, do you think the world would be welcoming the United States back into these agreements, or yeah. has the damage been kind of permanent? That's a, that's a great and very thoughtful question, and my answer to that is that some things will be easier to jump back onto than other things, and that the United States is still seen as a strong leader, but the longer we go on where the perception is that either we've disengaged or we have we have alienated allies, for example— um, or done things that might corrode multilateral institutions, the world will start to move around you in the long term. That, that's, so when you, you know, that was my concern with the president badgering Mexico very early on, or Canada or Germany, is that countries will start to look for other trading partners. And it was a wake-up call for Mexico. Now, fortunately, it looks like we may have a renegotiated agreement. But they don't have to buy everything that they do from us, right? So the world can start to move around you in terms of trade, and the world can move around you in terms of the infrastructure for diplomacy and dispute resolution. So the, the, short, the long and short of it is the longer that we go on, I think the president, I believe, right now can attain short-term victories. Because we are the largest economy, he can elbow countries into getting what he wants. I think we're going to see that. I think that's part of part of what happened with Canada and Mexico. But those countries will not stay the same. They will start to count on going around the United States in some way. They're not just going to sit there and take it. Uh, and that is, I think, that's part of the concern for me. Uh, in terms of trade, I think for all of us, we need to think about what the next, assuming there is one, uh, the next American trade agreement looks like. I mean, consider this. In the 2016 presidential election, it wasn't just Democrats that were against or, or Republicans that were against stated against TPP. Both presidential candidates came out against TPP. So how do you come back in 2020 or 2024 and both substantively and politically sell a free trade agreement? I do think that the renegotiation, renegotiation of NAFTA, I've been watching that as a bellwether. I've said I'm watching NAFTA as a bellwether to determine whether this administration and this country is going to be open over the next several years to doing any kind of multilateral agreement or even a bilateral agreement. There's been news of a bilateral with Japan, for example, mm -hmm. um, and, and whether we can achieve those things. But what does the next – what has to change? Because I don't think that we can sell the same old stuff. Something's got to change. And I guess even beyond all those deals, just an observation, not a question, you know, what happens when, God forbid, we have another – global crisis and we go running to some of these countries for help in other ways. Right? Sure. Daniel yeah. Moss, you had a question? Can you press your uh, microphone? Yeah. So Daniel Moss, Bloomberg Opinion. Yeah. Congressman, dive just a little deeper for us on USMCA. The revised rules of origin. Okay, can you, uh, for the rest of us... Sorry. Yeah. The, you want to give the context? So be, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I mean, are there, th in terms of broad support across the aisle for trade agreements and what does the next one look like? Yeah. Are there things in USMCA, like if revised you, rules of origin, uh, some of the labor NAFTA. reports, yeah. right. is that the sort of thing that you mean could be a template? And when I say rules of origin, I don't just mean autos, I mean textiles and some of those other clauses. You're the first person here, by the way, Daniel, to use USMCA. It's yeah. the US-Mexico-Canada sorry, agreement. Agree. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's the rewrite of NAFTA, right? Um, yes, and, and what you see with, with the new agreement is some pulling from the TPP, 
right? Uh, which is an improvement uh, on paper, at least, uh, on some of these things, including rules of origin. So, yeah, I mean, I think that could be a baseline. It's hard for me to give you a uh, prognostication about what exactly is going to happen in the Congress because we're out of session right now and the news broke once we were out of session. And I haven't had the full benefit of talking to my colleagues and all of us getting together, putting our heads together and figuring out where we go. And as I understand, just checking in with labor, for example, that labor right now is on the fence. So they've not come out and said, hey, you know, we're completely against this rewrite. Um, and, and to be fair, also, the AFL-CIO was not against scrapping NAFTA completely. They never took that position. Right. Um, so so, yes, I think it could be a positive step. I also think that there's some things that we're going to have to do that we've not done before. Uh, in future agreements. Real quick, uh, I think we need a larger pre-enforcement fund. Um, the second part is we have to work better with and invest more with and expect more from the countries that we're partnering with in terms of raising the labor and wage standards in their countries <clears throat> when, we, when we partner with them. Uh, so, for example, I was with President Obama on his trip to Vietnam in uh, May of 2016. You know, and you still have folks that work for 60 cents an hour. Uh, I know that the prices are different and so forth, so it's not apples to apples. Uh, but I think the American people are getting less willing to accept competing with people in different parts of the world where the wages are so low uh, and the risk of losing more and more jobs. So we have to do everything that we can to build up the infrastructure for organizing for opportunity in those countries to help lift the labor standards there. Um, and the and I know the unions actually have an international branch that does some of that work, but it's not, as far as I can tell, it's not to scale. So I, we've got to do a much better, better job of that. And it can't just be on paper because I would, I would, analogize to our own experience as a nation. You think about the promises and the, the guarantees and the rights that were afforded to us in our founding documents and how long as a society it has taken to actually realize those things. And we're not completely there yet, but we've come a long way. Uh, I, would, I would make a rough comparison to trade agreements that what's on paper is not necessarily what you're going to get at year one or even year five or year 10, unless you really put in an infrastructure to make those things happen. And that, I think, has been a missing critical component in our trade agreements. Yes, the woman to Daniel's left. And if you can just identify yourself, that'd be great. Uh, Diana Parker. I, I'm concerned, a ch permanent change that I'm concerned about is um, the money going into the Philippines from China in exchange for which China gets a reversal in the Philippine government's position with respect to Chinese encroachments on islands in the West, West Philippine Sea. And that encroachment, as long as it's not, it's conceded by the current Philippine government, that can be a permanent change, and I don't think that China cares whether that money, whether it's called loans or not, is repaid. What they get in exchange is no opposition to what they're doing in the West Philippine Sea. And the United States and the Philippines used to work together um, against China's encroachments, but the current Philippine government is not interested in working with the United States at all and is very interested in Chinese money. I think you're right to be concerned. Um, and the implications of things like that go beyond their impact on just the Philippines, but on the region and really the world, I think. Um, and so you're right. I mean, that, that is a concern. And I mentioned that in 2017 with Ann Wagner, a Republican congresswoman from Missouri, we started the U.S. ASEAN caucus. And we've built it up to 20-something members. At one point, Scott knows this, the U.S.-Japan caucus around the time of TP TPA had about 100 members that we had built it up to. But as we've met with the foreign ministers, as we've met with the ambassadors and others from ASEAN, it's clear that for some of the nations at least, they feel like they're having to choose mm -hmm. in terms of loyalties between China and the United States. And 
for a lot of them, it makes them very uneasy uh, because they don't want to be part of a cold war, so to speak, between the two countries. Uh, but it's also clear that for others, they're kind of tipping their hat a little bit as to where they're headed. Uh, and the situation you described is, is one that I would include in that basket. Isn't there something in, uh, in I don't know if it's in your caucus congressman or just in, in the Congress generally, uh, sort of a, an effort called reassuring Asia or something like that. Yeah, and, and, and because that's sort of a, an, an interesting concept. You know, we had to pivot to Asia, now we have right. to reassure Asia. Yeah, so is, that, <laughs> is that part of what? Yeah, your work is. Oh, that's absolutely the the reason that we, especially the the U.S. ASEAN caucus. Remember, President Obama talked about a pivot to Asia, but President Obama's term was done January of 2017. So especially with the U.S. ASEAN caucus, it was a way for us to get members of Congress more attuned to paying attention to this block of nations. And as far as, you know, at least in terms of my intent, was to continue in the legislative branch what the president had started in the executive branch, which was this pivot and this focus on Asia. And for the U.S.-Japan caucus, it's been great. I mean, you know, I started that caucus with Devin Nunez. Uh, who, of course, chairs the Intel Committee now. He and I were the original co-chairs He's in 2013. He's busy on some other yeah. things, right? <laughs> you may have heard of him, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, in fact, when he became chair of Intel, he had to stop being co-chair of the U.S.-Japan caucus. Um, but, yeah, but it's been a great way to encourage dialogue and visits and policy discussions among members of the Diet in Japan and members of the Congress. So it's been a very helpful vehicle for that. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Scott Parvin at Aiken Gump, and uh, a comment and a question. First, I, I really want to thank you for your continued leadership on these issues in Washington um, at a time when there are very few members of Congress uh, in either party who are either focused on these issues or speaking about these issues. So on behalf of all thank of you. us here, I really want to thank you for that continued leadership. No, thank you. Um, touch upon Japan for a moment. Um, uh, as someone who has started and built the U.S.-Japan caucus, you're well aware of the important relationship, the critical relationship between the United States and Japan. Japan's in a bit of a tricky situation these days in terms of its trilateral relationship with China and the United States. Mm -hmm. Could you touch a little bit upon the relationship, the current bilateral relationship, the state of the relationship, and where you think it might be headed and should be headed? Between the U.S. and Japan. Please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it is strong, obviously one of our strongest alliances around the world. Uh, for Japan, I saw real, real leadership in Japan going and basically being the shepherd after the United States dropped out of TPP and saving TPP-11. Uh, and for that, for, the, for Japan, was a way to demonstrate real leadership in the region uh, and was helpful to the United States as well. You know, again, I mentioned that for the United States, particularly for our domestic politics, the agreement didn't quite work for us, but they they took the mantle, and after that, we're successful in that. Um, so much of the, especially the early part of this year, was dominated by the nervousness over the North Korea issue, and for what a, for a, for a minute looked like we might actually get into a conflict with North Korea. Um, so you know, now that we've emerged from that. Uh, which is a positive thing. Uh, I think we're back on track. I feel like we're back on track in terms of the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, and I, I see us both sailing in the same direction in terms of wanting, wanting to encourage democracy, wanting to encourage trade, wanting to respect human rights. I mentioned that Japan's been helpful over on the Rohingya issue, which has been great. Um, and also, uh, Japan remains incredibly loyal to the United States and a great friend. So I'll, I'll be there. I think you're probably going to be there, at, going to be at the Mount Fuji dialogue later in the month. Quick one, because North Korea came up just for yeah. the first time. Good idea, bad idea. Did you think before the visit, at least, for the president to meet with Kim in Singapore? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought that, well, by the time they met, I thought that was a much more positive turn of events than basically what – for a second there, it reminded me of Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. reminded me of when you're growing up and you're in school and you see two guys who are standing nose to nose and it feels like that second before somebody throws a punch. Right? That's, that's what it felt to me a little bit like. And unfortunately, it, nothing happened. Um, but 
what's been what's been problematic after the meeting is that at least if the reporting is to be to be believed that North Korea has developed its nuclear capabilities further, that their nuclear capabilities are further along. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not to say that there hasn't been something positive, And I want to give the president credit here that has come from this. And both leaders, even before the summit, went into each other's lands for a second. Uh, they've sent the, they've sent remains of U.S. service members back to the United States. South Korea and North Korea have submitted a, or are going to submit a joint bid for the 2032 Olympics. Uh, relatives on each side have been able to speak to each other uh, more frequently than in the past. So there has been there have been positive things that have come out of it. But if the goal was a denuclearized North Korea mm. on that score, this has been a failure. Okay, I'm sorry. I, uh, oof, well, and I also one point. Yeah. Also, I also gave uh, at the time before this before the summit. I gave the president a lot of credit in terms and Nikki Haley in terms of going to the U.N. and getting the strongest sanctions that North Korea has ever faced placed upon North Korea. And I, I thought that was diplomatically it, it was the right approach. And I thought that it was an important achievement. Let's go for some gender diversity yeah. if we can. The woman there. Yes. Thank you, Sarah Valero. Um, thank you, Congressman. Uh, what are some strategies that you would implement to connect issues like the South China Sea and the Rohingya crisis to the districts that you represent and by extension your state <laughs> and local constituents? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, you know, I try in my discussions with, uh, let me describe my district a little bit. Uh, San Antonio and the 20th district at the time was the place where NAFTA was signed mm-hmm. in San Antonio in the mid-1990s. So San Antonio and Texas are a place that, places that understand the importance of international engagement, economic trade. Uh, also, Texas has been a place that has been the home, become the home for many refugees from around the world. And there are great organizations like Catholic Relief Services and others in Texas that help place refugees. Um, that said, I have a bread and butter district. I have a very working class district. Uh, if you know the home prices in Texas, are any Texans or former Texans here? Nobody. Wow. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, oh, well, the homes in my district range everywhere from about $50,000 to about a million dollars. And in Texas, a million dollars is usually a mansion, right? Um, at least in my district. And so, it's a bread and butter district where people are mostly concerned about the, you know, whether they have health care, whether they have job, their kids' education. That said, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Intelligence Committee, right? Uh, although San Antonio is also a very big military town. Um, so I've always tried to communicate these things, the importance of these issues to my constituents uh, and the importance of San Antonio's role, uh, because we are known as Military City USA, the importance of the policy and what it means for our city. Uh, if, for example, we're drawn into another war uh, or if there is a conflict that we're going to respond to, what it means for the service members who are in San Antonio, for the families that are in San Antonio. Did you have one? Yes. Lisa McLaughlin. Lisa um, McLaughlin. Uh, the recycled materials market. And I'm wondering whether if you could comment on China's decision either to curtail or to eliminate buying our recycled materials. Hmm. Because we are very dependent on China for this. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, I think, obviously, a very unfortunate development for us. Uh, I, I want us to be able to sell as many of our goods as possible to China, as many things as possible. So to the extent that, whether it's because of the tariffs or something else, um, China is pulling away from the U.S. market, then that's actually that's obviously a harmful thing for us um, and going in the wrong direction. Uh, and that's when I mentioned that there doesn't seem to be a, a foreseeable, basically a foreseeable end to what's going on or a stated goal. You know, in other words, once we achieve these two or three things, now we're going to get out of this trade war. Um, I mean, that's problematic. But specifically the recycled materials, do they not need these materials anymore, or is it a political decision? Uh, honestly, uh, I, I can't answer that right now. You know. I, I mean, just 
reading things, it sounds like it's a political thing, like almost every other somewhat punitive sounding thing that's that's popped up recent, recently. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the excellent lecture. Uh, my name is Helen Ye. I work for Ogilvy, but I also sit on the American Chamber of Commerce uh, in China board. So we represent thousands of American business in China. I've been lobbying for them for many, many years. But now with the trade war, many of our members actually been impacted negatively by the tariff. And also what our statement is, we only need reciprocal treatment. You know, it's simply like we we'll open the regulatory, uh, regulatory territory and then let American business come in. But uh, we also organize like uh, annual DC door knock. But it seems like American right. business in China's voice can never be heard. So what's your opinion on that? Thank you. No, you're right. And actually, I, I try to meet with the different AmCHAMs, the American chambers that come in uh, regularly. And not too long ago, I met with one of the AmCHAMs in China. And their position was, look, I'm, I'm going to distill it here for a second. But you know, we, basically, they were saying, look, we don't really agree with how the president went about all of this. Uh, but we feel as though China has been knocking us around for years. And we want a more open market, open markets in China. And, you know, now that we're in the middle of this thing, we ought to try to get as much leverage as possible. Um, so. Yeah, before, because the, every year we have like two rounds of dialogue, uh, I said ED and the GCCT, lead by the finance department and commerce. Now they all stopped. It's like uh, these ad hoc meetings with China. It's not like no system. Like you said that uh, China has a comprehensive plan, laid out a plan. The U.S. have no plan to, to, to deal with that. But in China, actually, pe Chinese people think U.S. has laid a comprehensive plan, a plan and they don't understand how <laughs> to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so each of us thinks the other one's better organized, Amy. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Um, we've approached the witching hour. I do want, before uh, uh, we let the congressman go, uh, to just make one more point, and maybe it's something you can comment on. And in a way, I'm picking up at what the gentleman, uh, Scott from Aiken Gump, said. Uh, I mean, it is really refreshing, to put it that way, to uh, speak with a member of the House of Representatives about all these issues and your facility uh, on just virtually everything we've talked about is, is, is great, and, uh, and we appreciate it. Um, I also, before we came in here, we were uh, reflecting, as, as one does now, whether you're with congressmen or not, about uh, the state of play on, on domestic fronts in this country. The moment we're in, you've mentioned, at least alluded to, the divisiveness uh, yeah. on so many fronts, and that he was on Chris Hayes' show on MSNBC yesterday talking not about any of these issues but about the Kavanaugh uh, <laughs> hearings. And so that's a long way of saying, Congressman, I wonder if um, uh, I mean, this is refreshing, but are there things uh, that may be a little bit more hopeful as you uh, do your work uh, on the Hill and back in your district? Uh, should we, as uh, readers and consumers of news, uh, just think, you know, as some senators have said recently, the country's being ripped apart and there's no, you know, uh, w what goes on on Capitol Hill or in your uh, uh, work that might uh, give the rest of us, whatever our, our political predilections, uh, some some reasons for hope. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, look, the country throughout its history has gone through rough periods politically, through tense periods. I'm sure you know, my mom and my dad are both baby boomers. My dad's 78, my mom's 71. So the folks who lived through the 1960s and 70s period of Watergate, and even before that, 1968, which was such a turbulent year in the country's history, understand that we go through tough times. But the fundamental character, as far as I can tell, of this country has not changed. Uh, this is still a country of hardworking, compassionate people, I believe, who are committed to making sure that there's an infrastructure of opportunity for everybody here. And I believe that it's by making sure that we have that opportunity that the United States, you know, we didn't talk much about it, but that's how we remain competitive. Uh, that's how we make sure that this is a leader among nations. You know, and the way that I would put it is, 
50 years ago, if you asked somebody who was living in China or in Africa or Asia or Latin America, where on earth they would want to go if they were going to leave their home country, 50 years ago, the answer was very clearly the United States of America. I still believe that we're in a position, all of us as Americans, to make sure that when you ask that same question 50 years from now, that the answer is still going to be the United States of America. So thank all of you for all of your work as well. Thank you.